Hey, everybody, thank you for joining Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and our event on the state of stripe, stripers. Um, my name is Rob Parkins. I'm the public access coordinator for Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And although I live in Idaho now, I grew up on the East Coast in Connecticut and um, fishing for striped bass is something that I've done for a long time. And I've told people that if striped bass were in the rivers of Idaho, I would never leave. It's um, it's it's definitely something that's near and dear to me. I've been gone for 18 years and um, I've seen quite the decline and hearing from a lot of people um, about the declines and, uh, for quite a while. And there's been some up and downs for, for the last 10 years. It's been a pretty bad situation. So we brought together the New York and New England chapters of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and um, a couple people that are in the industry and i'm going to let them introduce them or give themselves an introduction but we have chris borgatti a board member from the new england chapter of backcountry hunters and anglers charlie whitetech who is a policy advisor for the new york chapter um we have abby um and Abby runs Kismet Outfitters on Martha's Vineyard, and Peter Jenkins, who runs the Saltwater Edge and is also the board president for the American Saltwater Guides Association. So I thank you all for joining us. And Abby, let's start off with you, if you could give us a brief introduction. Hi guys, thanks for having me and for signing in. Um, my name is Abby Schuster. I'm a captain on Martha's Vineyard. Um, I guide, primarily um, fly fishing for stripers, blues, albies, and bonito. Um, I run a 23-foot boat and a flats boat as well. We have an awesome flats fishery here. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Peter? Yes, so Peter Jenkins. I uh, own the Saltwater Edge in Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, like Abby, um, Fish for some of the same species, stripers, albies, um, and uh, and then as it relates to the Saltwater Guide Association, that's an organization that believes um, that sustainable. You need to manage fisheries in a sustainable way to to build a sustainable business. So that made uh, you know it's sort of been our uh, approach from the beginning and my um, you know strong belief, and it's uh, an organization that's got some momentum around uh, striped bass in particular, but we're starting to be a little broader. Excellent. And Charlie. Yeah, Charles Whittick, live right now on the South Shore of Long Island in West Babylon, New York. Grew up in the southwest corner of Connecticut, been a striped bass fisherman since the 1960s. I actually fished through the previous collapse of the striped bass, saw them, saw them collapse, saw them rebuilt know what a collapse looks like and knows what how important fisheries management is. It was actually the collapse that got me involved in fisheries management in the first place. Uh, and I've been active in it ever since. I've been on the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. I serve as advisor on two ASMFC advisory panels. I sit on the Marine Resources Advisory Council here in New York, and I'm generally involved in fisheries issues. Excellent. Thank you. And Chris? Hi, Chris Borgatti. I'm uh, a member of the New England Chapter uh, Board of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Uh, I also am um, on the Massachusetts State Leadership Team. And uh, we've been uh, kind of uh, kind of weighing in, if you will, on ocean issues uh, for the past year. Kind of COVID kind of delayed that uh, a little bit. But uh, in terms of our involvement, New England's got over 470 miles of coastline and 6,000 miles of tidal shoreline, and pretty much you can catch stripers along that entire stretch. Uh, I grew up fishing for stripers um, all through Massachusetts. I was lucky to be uh, down uh, in uh, the Monomoy area during the 90s when that flats fishery and kind of picked up, and also fishing the rips and the beaches, uh, and then. Um, in the past 17, 18 years, I've been living here in the North Shore uh, and uh, came in just at the right time uh, and enjoyed some just fantastic uh, fly fishing, light tackle fishing on 
Joppa Flats and uh, numerous other locations around this neck of the woods. Awesome. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> like I said, I've been gone for 18 years and I haven't been bass fishing as much as I wanted to in that time, just getting back east. And I have been lucky to fish from Maine down to the Chesapeake and had a lot of great experiences. And um, I have to say is that some people probably nod their head and um, remember remember some of the people, but the, the folks that were able to take me under their wing and get me started fishing for a striped bass are John Posh, who used to own the Stratford Bait and Tackle, um, Louis Tabory, who wrote the book on striped bass fishing, actually now is a neighbor of mine living down in Pinedale, Wyoming. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, whenever I go back for a fly fishing show or talk to my friends is a lot of them that are very serious striper fishermen. Um, videos, premier tires, they don't fish for stripers anymore. They'll go to the beach. You know, Bobby Popovics is one of them down in New Jersey, lives right at Island Beach State Park, and he just he doesn't fish anymore. He'll, he'll go down there and hang out with people. And, but uh, stripers are off limits, and it's unfortunate that we have those um, opportunities diminishing for us. And before we get into the meat of what's going on with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the economic effects that stripers do have, um, let Chris, if you don't mind, if you could touch on the opportunities, um, what more fish, you know, how does that lead to more opportunity? And another question that we get asked quite a bit at Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is why are we commenting on something like this? Um, you know, we're a public lands organization, so why should we care about striped bass? Sure. The, well, as I said just a few minutes ago, you know, that 473 miles of coastline, uh, it's over 6,000 uh, miles of tidal shoreline. Um, you know, we talk about wild lands, wild places, and it, it honestly doesn't get any wilder than when you step off that beach, when you step off that shoreline, you are in a different world. Uh, and uh, not only that, particular to the striped bass, it's just one of these fish that is so accessible. You know, you could be running the, the flats boat or running the, the 27 foot, you know, super center console, didn't get and have just as good a chance as the person paddling around the kayak or the person uh, chucking or lobbing a a uh, three ounce sinker with a with a sea worm. It is a resource that is there for everyone, um, and uh, it's just it's that opportunity that I think is so critical for us to kind of to weigh in to make sure it's something that we have access to down the road. That's um, that's definitely it. And Peter, you've been in this business. I don't even. I can't even remember the first Almost time I went to the saltwater edge. Yes, and uh, you, you cover everything at the shop. And what do you see from the recreational side of, you know, how it affects your business, both gear, fly wise? Sure. I, I um, you know, recreational fishing is the the, the striped bass is the linchpin that holds together recreational fishing in the Northeast. You know, uh, it's a as uh, as we just said that you know you can catch them in March, you can catch them in November, you can catch them on lures, you can catch them on flies from a beach, from a kayak, from a boat. It is literally every man's fish, and for that reason, um, it's to me the linchpin that holds the whole thing together. So you know, we've always focused our business on surf, fly, and inshore fishing, and striped bass is the, probably the the, the most uh, important piece of that puzzle. I'd share that in Rhode Island, for example, um, recreational fishing is bigger than, uh, makes a bigger economic contribution to the economy than commercial fishing. And it's close. It's like, you know, 45, 55, but we haven't, uh, as a group of recreational anglers, done a very good job, the best job we can, of getting a collective voice. Right. We, we if the one of the rules of war or whatever that book is, is to divide and conquer. We take care of that ourselves. Right. The fly guy goes to a fly show and reads a fly fishing magazine. The surf guy goes to uh, Striper Day and the 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 uh, inshore guys offshore, you know, not not in the parking lot with the other guys. So we have lost a way, We've lost an, uh, an advantage and an opportunity that's ours. And that's to be heard. And so. Um, 
you know, as we get, as we find our voice, I think we will, we will um, level the, the playing field. It's really not a conscious lack of participation, but a lack of a cohesive voice. So I hope to see that change. And, uh, you know, um, we certainly have more people fishing now. Uh, that's more of a COVID impact than, than, um, than other situations, but it's more pressure on a resource, more pressure on the access, more pressure on the, the fishery itself. So right. with that bigger group comes, you know, trade-offs, if you will. Um, you brought up a good point, and it wasn't something that I was going to ask right now, but uh, I was watching a previous video of my research when um, the Saltwater Guides Association announced that they hired uh, Willie Goldfish as the executive director. Well, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> but Goldfish is his Instagram. Uh, yes. But, you know, what um, – what him and Tony were talking about is how the Guides Association has to partner up with people. They need to have their voices heard. And, you know, you just explained that where there's commercial fishermen, there's recreational fishermen, and there's the fly guides. And, and they don't hang out in the parking lot and talk about these things. Um, they may sit in a bar and argue about it and nothing gets done. But what, what do we do to get everybody together? Um. Well, I think the first is education and outreach. You know, I mean, we've tried to take the Guides the Guide Association and Saltwater sort of echoes that where we can. Um, it's complex and it's tough. I mean, you know, God love Charlie here. I mean, he's been in it a long time man, and he could take some pretty thick material and make it digestible. And so, you know, plenty of times uh, the Guide Association has produced literally a two pager to try to to, to make some sense without oversimplifying but uh, um you know i find the atlantic states marine fisheries in the process to be um you know it's disheartening um and it has been so we just hope we can keep keep uh people in the game and participating because that's the key you know um right. part of me being involved here is there's a rhode island issue around access to the shoreline that we're working on together you know so mm -hmm. that's part of how you make the tent bigger i think that's great that you guys are or here on striped bass, you ask the question, you know, why are you involved in striped bass? I think it's for the same kind of reason, you know, access is important as well, you know? Right. Uh, you don't have one without the other. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, I'm going to go on to Abby and Abby living on the vineyard. Um, everybody knows the big thing that happens there every year is the big Arthur's vineyard striped bass derby. Um, mm -hmm. it's a couple of years now, can't fish for striped bass in the striped bass derby. Um, what what are the impacts of that? But um, I guess in the same vein is how do we come together to get everybody to understand that if if you want to have that tradition for a month up on the vineyard that we need to work together. Right. I mean, I'm really actually proud of the derby to take striped bass out because. Um, I fought pretty hard for that, and I'm really proud that they did take the initiative because it's definitely not an easy one to. It's called the Striped Bass Fishing Derby to take that out, <laughs> um, but it's the best for our community um, and the fishery. The Derby, beyond being just an awesome event, brings so much business to all the guides on island, my shop, the other shops, the restaurants, the hotels, the ferry, the car. I mean, it's like the whole island blows up. And without that, I mean, it's not beach season necessarily. So it's like a shoulder season where it gets people to the island. Um, I think through education and teaching the future generations how we can get back on point and how we can come together and create a more sustainable future, we can get them back in the derby. Um, but it's, a, it's sad. I mean, I think it's really good, though, because people – follow the derby and they're setting a really good example of we don't come together and act then this is how our life this is how it's going to be right and it's crazy like i guide for stripers every day and we see stripers every day a ton of them but they're all the same exact size they're one class and so mm -hmm. it's, it's where i've had struggle guiding is you know i'll talk about all this with some of my clients that maybe aren't as familiar it's not their fishery they're like, what do you mean? We saw 100 fish today or 20 fish today or four fish today. And I'm like, yes, but <laughs> notice how they were all 
the same fish, basically. They are one class and, you know, we have to, I don't know. I take it very personally to try and teach my clients to protect this class so we can grow. You know. Excellent. Sure. Um, and Charlie, are you saying the same thing out on the point? Um, obviously it's different, but it's at the same time. You're getting all those fish that are coming down from the vineyard and everywhere in the Northeast. And as we know, it's, it's probably the most epic saltwater fishery that I've ever been a part of. Um, how has that changed? Yeah, I mean, basically what we're seeing now is we're seeing 2003s and 2015s. The 2003s are big fish. They're 40 pound fish. There's a fair number of them compared to what you normally see in terms of 40s in the population. But then there's nothing until you get down to what this year will be barely legal slot fish, 28 inch fish that we'll see last year. Last year, they were 25, 26 inch fish that are 2015 year class. In New York, it's a little bit different because we get the Hudson. 2007 mm -hmm. was the biggest year class ever recorded in the Hudson. So mm -hmm. right now there's a lot of 30 pound stuff in, R in Raritan Bay. But those fish don't travel much further than maybe Rhode Island. No, a few travel further, but on the coast itself, you won't see it. Right, but we, right. you see just what Abby said, we've got these distinct year classes and nothing in between. And are those fish, is the, um, I think I'm getting a little feedback here, is the mortality, uh, are people recognizing the fact that these stocks are diminishing and um, cutting back on what they're keeping in a recreational fishery? Well, traditionally, you don't have a lot of retention in a recreational fishery. If you look at the years 2015 to 2019, the average was 92% release rate, just a little bit under. It's like 91.8% release rate. In New England, Massachusetts has the lowest release rate at 95%. So the striped bass fishery, really since the collapse, has become largely a catch and release fishery. The difference is the for hire fishery, if you take the guide boats out of it, which are a little bit different, but the traditional six packs, the, tr the party boat fishery, you're looking at 55 to 65% release rate. You're looking at over 90% release rate for the private boats and for the surf casters. I guess I'm going to go right into the question that uh, in an upcoming blog you have for our website, um, you know, you talk about that there are two major questions and there is one of them that is most important and uh, excuse me, but I'm scrolling up to it. And um, the major question that you said that is the most important is what do we do? What, what do we want to do with the striped bass? What do we want the striped bass stock to look like? Um, and then you ask is how we got there. Um, how did we get there? Well, the way we got to where we are now, I hate to use a cliche because it is a very overused cliche, but striped bass really did endure the perfect storm where both environmental conditions, fishing conditions, and management all worked against them at the same time. To have a successful striped bass spawn, you need a cool, wet spring. That doesn't happen every year. So from 2004 to 2010, and arguably from 2004 to 2014, we did not have favorable spawning conditions. 2011 was a very good year class in the Chesapeake Bay, but it did not recruit into the fishery. Not, not completely sure why, although over harvest in Maryland is certainly a part of that. So we had fewer small fish coming into the fishery. At the same time, the managers didn't realize how many fish recreational fishermen were taking out of the fishery. The old survey that they used to gauge recreational effort was based on a telephone survey. 
It was very inaccurate. It was criticized by the National Academy of Sciences. Hmm. Now we use a mail survey. And even though we think of snail mail as an old fashioned way of getting information, it's actually very accurate for this purpose. And it shows that recreational effort, and as a result, recreational catch was more than twice as high as we previously understood it to be. So at the same time, we had fewer fish coming into the population, we learned there were more fish coming out of the population. And then the third aspect of that is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission ignored the warning signs. In 2011, there was a stock assessment update that even based on the underestimate of recreational fishery, fishing said that the population would be overfished by 2017. They took no action. 2013, a new stock assessment triggered a management trigger in the management plan that required a rebuilding, 10-year rebuilding plan to be put in place. They did not do it. 2016 stock assessment update said that in Chesapeake Bay, instead of reducing fishing mortality by 20.5% as they were supposed to under amendment four to the management plan or addendum four, I should say, fishing mortality increased by 58%. They took no action to reduce it and get it back to what the plan contemplated. 2019, they learned that a new benchmark assessment found the stock to be overfished. That also triggered a second requirement for a 10 year rebuilding plan. It did not occur. So we had bad conditions in the spawning rivers, more fishing mortality than we expected, and a management body that did not respond to problems with the stock. And that led us to where we are today. Literally didn't follow their own rules. Exactly. It said, you know, if you read the management triggers, management trigger two and four, both said when they're tripped, the management board must, and I emphasize the word must, put in a rebuilding plan that, re that would rebuild the stock within 10 years. We have not yet seen a rebuilding plan. And there's a lot of different things. That's crazy. Um, you know, here in Idaho, we blame everything on two things, Californians and wolves. Um, <laughs> so it's hard to wrap my mind around all the different bad management decisions and um, fisheries opportunities and, and overcatch and all that. Um, what what can we do as a recreational fisherman? Uh, I've seen reports that it's, I believe it's about 9% uh, hook mortality for a recreational fishermen is and I'm going to direct this question to Abby, but uh, what do we do? How do we teach people better catch and release habits, how to handle fish? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of different things that people look at, and there's people that blame social media and the way people handle fish and that we need to do a better job. And I know that you make it a point on your guide trips and in the shop to educate new anglers on proper catch and release techniques. Yeah. Um, I personally don't let anyone keep any fish on my boat so they know that before they get on board i've lost clients over it but i'm proud of the clients that i have that understand it um but even then like it has to go beyond that i use barbless hooks only because one for like my own safety a few hookings. but um <laughs> but also it's just a quick release it's it, it gets the hook out really quickly um also the minute we they get it in quickly as we can i keep it in the net until the camera's ready until everything is set because i don't let them keep it so we have to take a photo because you know so it's a quick out of the net they take their photo and then it goes back into the net and so it really the fish aren't out of the water um that long and then i'll either hold the um mouth or keep it in the net until it's ready to go and then i'll release it from shore i think it's really important not to drag it up onto the beach um that is not good for anything or gills or skin anything so a net is key i mean waiting out there before you drag it all the way up i understand it can be hard sometimes but or getting a buddy to do it or someone down on the beach to net that fish keep it in the water 
remove the hip quickly. And even then, even following all that, we do lose a couple stripers every year because they ingest the hook and it's really hard. But just to do your part of that is good. I try to make it educational on my boat so when people go on their own, they can practice that because a lot of people just don't know. I mean, it's not born with knowledge. You know, you have to learn it. So, yeah. Chris, what about you? I know that you uh, take a bunch of people out, not as a guide, just, uh, you know, fishing buddies and doing different things. Is there uh, anything that you see that we could do better as far as teaching catch and release and better fish management practices? You know, I was thinking about this today, as a matter of fact, and I know a lot of the conversation about recreational fishing has uh, been around the use of different hook types. And, um, uh, a guy I used to first mate for out of Beverly, I, I, the fishing back then at the time was just stellar. And, um, and I, I think he probably had just an inkling of what was to come and was a really early adopter of, uh, we're doing a lot of live lining of mackerel and stuff, just an early adopter of, of circle hooks. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've seen that sort of, that change uh, happen, you know, just maybe going back 15 years or so. Um, you know, when when I'm fishing with kids, uh, again, it's a lot of that same type of stuff that that Abby mentioned, uh, minimal contact. And um, you know, some of my some of my students uh, back in the day, we were doing a lot of uh, work with some of the mark and recapture studies. So. You know, we were we were following some best practices in terms of fish handling, anyways, because we, we were we were uh, tagging some of these fish. Um, so, like those 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 practices of just being quick, barbless hooks. Um, I'm a huge. Uh, when I when I moved here, I was kind of a recruit, recovering trout bum, I will admit. And uh, when I learned that uh, by using uh, lights, tackle, spinning gear, and uh, some soft plastics that I could get into some really big fish very quickly. Uh, that uh, when we start, and I started sort of switching over into that, and then uh, rediscovering the uh, Zara Spook that I used to catch largemouth bass in the local ponds growing up, uh, moving those to, to, to uh, just single hooks, changing those out. Uh, a little bit larger hook, like I would, we did a bit, bunch of experimenting and just went kind of a larger hook than one might imagine. And the hookup rate is pretty good. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just been a change. In recent years with a lot of the schoolies around, it's been a little bit tougher. But then again, we're not, we're not damaging fish. So I guess that's right. the thing. Now, Peter, um, mm -hmm. Charlie... Charlie talked about the the difference in the in the in the mortality of the different segments of of the fisheries, whether it's a recreational fishery, the inshore guide, and um, then he could go all the way to the from the party boats to commercial fisheries. Mm -hmm. What's the difference there as far as as far as what the different groups are doing to try to push us forward, and who is honestly making the biggest impact? as far as damaging the numbers? Um, you know, I think uh, too often um, the commercial uh, gets painted as evil. And in the case of striped bass, and it's great to have Charlie here, because this way I'll be, unmute yourself so you can cover me. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but um, the commercial, uh, you know, is less than 10% of the fishery, I believe, in total, right? Uh, but you know, you know, 100% of the fish they catch, they keep, right? So, right. Um, but the lion's share of the fishery is recreational, and the biggest mortality impact on the fishery is the 9% ish catch and release that you quoted earlier, right? So um, we need to continue, as Abby said, um, just trying to take the steps to to you know, cameras ready, everything else, think about it. I mean, you know, I have plenty of customers that keep fish, and I don't tell them not to sometimes when I make even a conservation um, blog post, I'll include a recipe because it's not about not catching and eating fish. That's what they're for. But um, the 
you, you need to respect it. You need to know what it's, you know, that I'm going to uh, do this fish with uh, red peppers and green peppers wrapped in foil with olive oil on the grill. You know what I mean? You got it all worked up in your head or your neighbors asked you nicely for a fish and this is the one that's for them. You know, something like that, not fill the freezer, not, um, you know, freezer burn. You got to a fish, uh, Lee Wolf said something like it, a fish is more, far more valuable than being caught just once. And now it's especially true. Yeah. It's quite fast. If, if I could, you know, Charlie made reference to two good year classes, 11, well, 2003, but 11 and 15. And 15 is the one that, that Abby's speaking of. She's everywhere, same size, cookie cutter fish. Um, 11 was four years earlier than 15. And that, uh, I might not put all the blame on Maryland. I don't think, I think Charlie sort of said that's not the case, but they overfished their quota by 219, 217%. And really went, wiped out that 2011 that would have helped this whole fishery rebound earlier, right? Four years earlier, perhaps, and have put this big bet and pressure on the 2015s. A 2015 fish, uh, 85% of them have spawned once. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so they haven't even had a couple cracks at it before they're in the slot. That's really concerns the hell out of me. You know that that they're exposed now to to um, being removed um, versus and and um, you know wow they haven't even had a chance to spawn one so I'm, I'm uh, the when we had our success with the moratorium and we're not in that bad a shape that as we were when we had the moratorium we the the plan there was basically to protect one year class through to maturity. You know, uh, to 36 inches, I think, was the number. And then they went back to 34 or something. But that act of, of, of basically walking them through the, uh, the uh, ca being a catchable fish is how we brought them back the last time. I'm not saying that's what we need to do now, but that was the act that did it, you know, was protecting the, the big year class. And I saw someone in the chat. They, um, they asked what's going to happen when that age class hits this the slot yeah there it is i don't know you know yeah. hey michael i don't know exactly what will happen i you know we're working on education and things like that to help people understand but just what's the wisdom of targeting fish that have spawned you know if you're trying to build rebuild the species of spawn of targeting a species uh, a year class that hasn't even spawned once you know um and um i i the charlie's pointed out striped bass spawn inefficiently right and so um, <clears throat> when you have an age, a more broad age structure, they don't all spawn on one moon in one place. It happens in a, uh, over a couple of moons in a couple of places and the, the, the water could be too cold or the salinity can be off or not salinity is some other one, oxygenation or something. Uh, but things can be off, right? Uh, but across the board, by the fact of a broader population distribution, you have a better chance of success, right? We've played ourselves into a corner here where our bet is really on this this one year class. Excellent. Um, yeah, I don't know. I heard in a bar that they do all spawn on the same day and on the same moon. And right. Nature right. doesn't do that. Nature uh, doesn't do that. You know? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> the good thing is uh, we're going to have Charlie uh, it, it tell us more about the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission uh, they are seeking input for a striped bass management plan uh, through Amendment 7, and uh, they are asking for public input through April 9th, and this is one of the reasons why we can hopefully answer questions for people to have an educated comment to the commission. And um, I know, Charlie, just like everything else that happens where there's public comment, is there's going to be a lot of, a lot of crazy thoughts and ideas that you know, we're probably born in a, in a boat launch parking lot or in a bar. Um, but I know as you being an ex attorney and everyone I know will say that you're probably uh, the wisest person on this subject. And if somebody was going to do you, loaded. I, I unfortunately lost part of that. It just that touched was on a compliment. I'm pretty sure it was a compliment. <laughs> it's a compliment. It was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs>
but my my computer cut out for just a second. I didn't hear all of it. Oh yeah, well I'm not going through that again. Um, you're I'll, I'll tell I'll tell it again. You're the expert, uh, and we're hoping that you can tell uh, tell us about Amendment Seven and uh, what we need to do to um, have educated comments uh, that are due this week and uh, how it's going to affect the fishery. Okay, right now the ASMRC is accepting comments on what's known as the public information document on Amendment 7. The PID is the first step in putting together a new amendment to the management plan. It's also the place where anglers, where stakeholders have the best opportunity to impact the amendment process. It's the beginning, nothing is off the table right now, and nobody has gotten their personal prestige too tied up in any particular measure. So right now, there is a chance to really influence the process. Uh, the PID is touching on a number of different topics. There are nine specific topics it's addressing, but the important ones are the first four. What should the goals and objectives of the management plan be? What biological reference points should be used to evaluate the health of the stock? What management triggers are appropriate to initiate management action? And what should the timelines be for management action? Quite honestly, the current goals and objectives are fine. Uh, the goal is basically to have a self-sustaining striped bass stock with a broad age structure and to protect that can support both recreational and commercial fisheries and also to protect the habitat that's important to the striped bass. It's difficult to, to have any objection to that, to that goal. The objectives can be broken down into two categories. One are what I'll call the biological objectives, which is to prevent overfishing, to keep the stock at the target spawning stock biomass level, again, to maintain a broad age and size structure, and to keep a number of larger, older females in the population. That's important because of what I mentioned before. You don't have good spawning conditions every year. So if you have a broad age structure first, different age fish spawn at different times. There's some research we've known for about 20 years that the larger, older fish spawn first, the younger, smaller fish spawn later in the season. So even in a bad spawning year, if for a couple of weeks or even a couple of days, there are more favorable spawning conditions, when you have a broad age structure, it's more likely that you're going to have some portion of the population that can take advantage of it and avoid spawning failure. And then you have the practical matter that if you maintain a broad age structure, even if you have bad conditions for five or six or eight years, you, with no small fish coming in, you still have the older fish to form kind of a spawning reserve which is actually what happened in 1982 when we had the good year class that brought us back from the collapse. Uh, so the current objectives are worth keeping in place. The current goal is worth keeping in place. The biological reference points support the objective. Right now, our threshold, which is the point that determines whether a stock is overfished or not, is based on 1995 population, which was the year that the bass was declared recovered after the collapse. The target biomass is 25% higher. Uh, that's based on the time, again, where the stock was healthy. It's worth keeping that in place because that will give us the good age structure, good population structure. Management triggers, when people, when the management board should act, basically if uh, fishing mortality gets too high, they have a year to bring it back to target. If spawning stock biomass gets too low, they have 10 years to get it back to target, to have a 10-year rebuilding plan. Those numbers make sense. Again, keeping that in place is a good thing. 
There's no need to change it. Uh, especially what you don't want to do is give the man give the management board more time to address problems because if you give them more time, they'll take advantage of it. They won't address the problems. Things will get worse. And the 10 year rebuilding time, we brought them back in 10 years after a collapse. Mm -hmm. Amendment three to the management plan, which is what rebuilt the stock the last time, went in place in 1985. We re rebuilt the stock by 95. If we could do it from a collapsed stock, we can do it today when, this, when the biomass is about four times as large. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense not to change those. Although there are people in New Jersey and Delaware and Maryland who want to change them because if they reduce the biomass targets, they can increase fishing mortality and increase landings while at the same time increasing the long-term risk to the population. So those are really the key issues in amendment in the PID. Then there are subsidiary issues, uh, conservation equivalency, should states be able to adopt measures that are different than those adopted by the management board, but supposedly have the same conservation effect. Historically, states use that to abuse the process, kill more fish than they would have otherwise. Regional management, the last stock assessment said there's no model that can pass peer review. So why are we trying to do something the science doesn't allow? Uh, recreational release mortality. This is a catch and release fishery. Mm -hmm. So release mortality is always going to be a large percentage of overall fishing mortality. If you go down to Florida, where basically you're not allowed to keep a tarpon, we're looking at release mortality being 100% of fishing mortality. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. As long as overall fishing mortality is kept below target, the fish will do fine. Recreational accountability, that's something that probably we should look at. If you don't set an overall harvest limit for the recreational fishery and you don't hold fishermen accountable when they exceed the target, you're going to see what you saw in Maryland from 2015 through 2019, where they never reduce landings, they increase landings, and nothing happens. So if you can overfish without consequence, the odds are you're going to overfish. So those are the primary issues in the PID. And you can find the PID at asmfc.org. It's the website of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And you can email them your comments on that to the address that's listed on that website by five o'clock on Friday, April 9th. Awesome, thank you. Um, and obviously it's important for everybody to use their voice and speak up. Um, Charlie, do they listen? Or is the public comment, do they just, uh, we don't want to hear this, we don't want to see this, or is it something that they actually listen to? That's a good question. I will say that I think they're listening a little more closely right now. One of the things that happened in the public hearings was there was a lot of not only uh, criticism of the stripe bass management plan, but criticism of the ASMFC generally. And I think they're getting concerned about their public image. Uh, because when people get too concerned about public image, they tend to take political action. And I think there's a little bit of concern about that and they're listening a little harder. If you listen to management board discussions, you will find that a lot of the management, a lot of the managers are concerned that, hey, people are losing faith in this. People don't believe we're doing our job. I went to a my state hearing and so many people are saying the ASMFC is just not, especially in New England, that the ASMFC is not doing what they're supposed to do. And the state managers are not happy about that. Having said that, do I think New Jersey is going to listen? No, I don't. Do I think Delaware is going to listen? No, I don't. Do I think the state reps in Maryland, and I'm, there are the governor's appointee and legislator's appointee, maybe they'll listen. The state rep, he's not going to listen. 
But in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, yes, I think they'll listen. Great. Well, hopefully it gets done. A uh, couple of quick things. Is there anything that uh, anybody here on the panel has that they that you feel we missed before we get into questions and then do some far, some parting thoughts? Um, I, I would just make the comment on, on conservation equivalency. You know, I agree with Charlie's uh, couple of hot buttons, but of, of, of all the others, that's the one that, that seems to cause the most duress for striper fishermen. You know, um, the conservation equivalency is the idea of an alternative proposal to create a similar uh, conservation, um, hit a similar conservation target, right? So these states will produce different um, options and you know, at the end of the day, I've never seen them miss high, okay? Um, <laughs> if the target's 18 and they get 15, I've never heard 21, right? I've never heard a miss, uh, like, too conservative, right? So um, why, with a fish that is overfished and overfishing is occurring, are we Mickey Mousing around with conservation equivalents? It's, it's proven to be a loophole and hard to measure, and almost always leads to something less than what we started out with. And my belief is that's another one. Um, you know, my letter has uh, the, the couple that Charlie mentioned in conservation equivalents as my key um, points of emphasis. I think there's nine or 10. There's just too many to go check, check, check through. It would be intimidating, I think, to anyone who's preparing a letter to think about all 10 of them. Charlie, that was very helpful to hear the couple. I would, I would just raise my hand and say, I, that con that 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 conservation equivalence is Satan's work, so I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to, to follow up on that, just a second. In a, in addendum six, add only a fifty a fifty percent probability of success in reducing fishing mortality back to target. Once conservation equivalency, particularly in New Jersey and Maryland, was figured in. It was changed. It now has a 58% probability of failure just because of the probability of the conservation <laughs> equivalency proposals. Anyone else have anything we need to touch on before we get to the questions? I just want to say that, you know, I know the link to the PID has been um, put in the, the chat. Um, and I, I recognize for a lot of folks who are new to this issue, it's a scary document and there's a lot of terminology that you may not be familiar with. Um, and this conversation has been great to sort of, uh, make it a lot more approachable, but, uh, tomorrow, uh, going live on the BHA website will be a number of resources, uh, an action alert, uh, a, uh, uh, some, some information to get you started and a, a letter that you can sort of begin to start that process and, and fill it yourself. So I do want to make that. Uh, so if you are a BHA member and uh, in New England or New York, you'll, you'll probably be getting an email on that um, after this at some point and those resources will be available. So I just want to make sure that's out there for people who are want to do something, but are, have opened that that document on the side window and are, are like, oh my God. So. And it is important to do something. Like we have to stick together and create this army. Cause like together we're a lot stronger than just all of us or one of us. And I think a lot of people do more than we think do take action. And so even if it's just you saying, just I'm taking action, it's one more thing. So pass it along and mm -hmm. create the army. Definitely. Great. Well, uh, as Chris said, we will be having some stuff published on the website tomorrow with a call to action, action alert. And uh, everyone who is registered for this event will be getting an email. Well, we will also um, we will send it to you. So if you have any information and I am just going to relay one other thing from the American Saltwater Guides Association. And they are running a raffle through Peter's Saltwater Edge, where if you were to comment and CC striper comments at gmail.com in your email to the commission, you'll be entered to win some cool prizes. And if you go to saltwaterguidesassociation.com, 
uh, there's more info on that raffle. So hopefully you guys flood their email box with uh, comments and somebody somebody wins some cool stuff from the Saltwater Edge. Thank you for mentioning that. You're welcome. Um, John and, and Tony and everybody at the, at, at the association is doing a great job and I love following them and seeing what they're doing. So thank you guys. Uh, let's, let's go to the questions here and I'm going to ask them and the person who has the best answer, raise your hand. If you all want to answer it, feel free. Um, first one we're going to start with is how do we, how do you suggest we increase public pressure for management agencies to follow through on their plans? I think there's two steps on that. First is the ASMFC itself. You have to attend the hearings. You have to let your displeasure be known. But more importantly, remember the ASMFC is an interstate compact. So who you really need to talk to are your state's ASMFC reps, which are going to be the state fishery manager, your state saltwater fishery manager, your governor's appointee, and don't hesitate to contact your governor's office as well, and your legislative appointee. They are all listed at the ASMFC website. Again, it's asmfc.org, and they have a pull-down menu that says about us and commissioners, and you'll find who your state commissioners are there and you should contact them directly. I, I also add, I think that, um, you know, they operate as, um, as uh, um, Charlie said, sorry, uh, that as a compact, right? And the other organizations, a good example would be NOAA, you know, are, have accountability, right? So if you have hypothetically a bluefin tuna quota of 100,000 and you catch 110, well, next year your quota is 90. That accountability is lacking in this organization, ASMFC, and in you know how they can pass or ignore a trigger that they must act, you know, without any kind of legal action ramification. It's why it's why they get the results they're getting, in my opinion. Yeah, what one of the things that's interesting about ASMFC is nobody knows how to hold them legally accountable. Yeah, they, right. There was a 2010 case, New York versus ASMFC, decided by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, that said that they are neither a quasi agency nor a federal agency and therefore are not subject to judicial review under the Federal Administrative Procedures Act. So, right now, they can do just about whatever they want to do and know, know that they cannot be sued as a result. Their, their track record, and I'll stop, <laughs> but their track record is of the 26 species they're responsible for, 17 of which are overfished, depleted, or condition unknown. That's a poor result, and they're, you know, working for us. Uh, to go to the side of this a little bit is uh, Patrick asked, for those of us fuzzy on it, could the group or someone from the group give the 30 second overview on how restrictions around size, take, et cetera, get put into place? Um, and for example, what government bodies are enacting these slot limits and take limits given its state and coast level policies? Um, and then who should a New England resident be lobbying, writing letters to? Um, Patrick, one obviously is to uh, send a comment to the commission and two, I'll leave it up to someone else to say who we need to contact. Well, I guess like Charlie just said, your individual state uh, folks, but I think Charlie's advice also around, you know, starting to go outside of the ASMFC <coughs> and your governor and, and people like that, we have to bring a different type of pressure than we've brought because it hasn't had an impact. I just gave you their track record and, um, you know, there is no legal avenue. So we have to change the rules or make them follow their own rules. <laughs> this may have worked if they'd followed their rules. You know, we might one not be in this situation. One of the most interesting things is if you read their actual interstate fishery management uh, 
charter, which supposedly governs their actions. It states that they are supposed to end overfishing, rebuild overfish stocks. Mm -hmm. It defines conservation equivalency much more narrowly than it's used. Mm -hmm. But they ignore their own charter, and there's no way to hold them accountable. Rogue. <laughs> and if, if I may add, just in terms of contacting electeds, um, that it also it's it's worthwhile making those economic connections, and we touched on it just briefly. But this is this is this is a, this has a real economic value. This fishery, um, and I, I think that that appeals to those individuals uh, probably perhaps a little bit more uh, meaningfully than the the fisheries council people. But. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I when I go to Washington, I I tell our representatives that more than half of the fishing licenses purchased in Rhode Island are purchased by people from out of state. That's called tourism. Now I got their attention. You know? sure. I've used that done the same thing, just more specific even to the island. It brings it's a whole different it brings so many people. Half my clients are from Seattle. You know, they're traveling yeah. here to fish. Yeah. It brings wow. a lot of money to our state. And like Peter said, when you go to Washington, D.C., and you talk to your representatives, you can tell them it's a feel-good story, how you caught your 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 biggest striped bass fishing with your grandfather at your favorite aunt's beach house. They don't care. If you start talking about the numbers, real numbers, if Peter was to sit down and say, you know, my business and every business of – guides and outfitters in the Northeast has dropped by 50% because of the loss of loss of striped bass. And you give them that number, you they pick up their pencil. And that's literally what they're doing. They have a pencil and they are writing this stuff down. So whenever you could use that, it is a, it, it's a great way to get people's attention. Um, let's go on to, um, is there any concern that there will not bounce that the fish will not not bounce back as high or as quickly now for any reason? Uh, examples: climate change, land development in the Chesapeake. And to add to that question, someone asked about um, protected harbor seals and the negative impact. Um, what are the impacts, and what is the biggest concern of as far as? bringing those fish back. I know Charlie touched on that earlier. That's your wheelhouse, Charlie. <laughs> well, again, successful recruitment depends upon favorable conditions in spawning rivers. So traditionally that means cool springs, wet springs, not floods, because floods are bad in their own in their own right. But wet springs, dry springs are bad. We're in, an, we're in an era of climate change. So yes, there is a very real possibility that we may not see as many cool, re cool wet springs in the Chesapeake watershed, basically Susquehanna River watershed, as we've seen before. It's not clear whether that's going to be the case or not. It is a concern. Thank you, Charlie. Um, sorry, I was trying to type an answer to someone uh, for something that we already covered. Someone asked if there are any advisories on consuming striped bass. And Peter, what is your favorite striped bass recipe? <laughs> Actually, that wasn't written, but I still want to know. Uh, <laughs> the, um, sorry, I'm just getting where I can plug this thing in. Um, I don't know. I like it simple. You know, uh, I like it fresh. And um, I like the vegetables. I like uh, um, peppers, you know, yellow and red, olive oil, tin foil, a little bit of basil maybe, and let, let just let that happen. So that's I'm not I'm not a pro. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Last question I'm going to ask. Um, can we talk about spare fishing in Massachusetts? Why is this legal in Rhode Island and New Hampshire? Chris, Abby, 
to your wheelhouse. <laughs> I get asked this question all the time, and I, I don't know to be honest. Like, why? I don't know. Yeah, I, I am. Well, I was actually just thinking about it the other day. I was talking to a VHA member about kind of getting back into diving. I used to spearfish down in Rhode Island uh, and a little bit down in Buzzards Bay for tog and scup and things like that. But you're right, striped bass are not uh, can not be legally take, taken uh, by spear or gaff. Uh, I think that is a statute. I don't think it's a regulatory thing. I could be wrong. Never really looked at it. I just kind of those days I used to dive when I had just a little bit more free time. Um, yeah, I, I, I just never. It's weird though, because there's such migratory fish. So like the same fish is in Rhode Island. That's, you know, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my guess is it's, it's, uh, it's a statute. Yeah. Uh, state statute. Yeah. And I don't, right. you know, I, they definitely have, um, you know, events here in Rhode Island, um, you know, spearfishing events. I just don't, um, and I'm just don't know, but I mean, how do you, how do you manage the size? You know, right. I don't think you could. Is that 28 inches, you know, or is that, <laughs> you know, 26, you know, it's, I think it'd be difficult and it's kind yeah. of a zero sum game, you know, so it's, I lot, it's definitely an experience thing. And, and uh, Though I, you know, I can't really speak for the community. I was, you know, a, a in and out member of the spearing community. Um, I would say that in terms of harvest, it's it's highly selective. Um, uh, so, you know, I, and in terms of like when I take uh, to tog, um, yeah, you just you get you check them out, you check them out. Yeah. yeah. You know, here in New York, we had recreational spear fishing was legal. Commercial spear fishing was not legal, primarily because of the slot. Now it's, it's easy to say, "Hey, that bass is over twenty-eight inches," but now is it over twenty-eight and under thirty-five in the time that you have to shoot? That's a little tougher to tell, and I I think the slot may actually have an impact on recreational spear fishing now, where before this. The guys who spear fish used to look for the big bass. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, sure, that's a legal fish. We can take it. Right. Now it's a little bit tougher. It's can you make sure that fish is inside a seven inch slot in the time you have to make the decision and shoot? A little bit tougher. Yeah. For sure. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for that. There's one other question, and I'm going to wrap this question up into the ending. We're, uh, we're just a little bit over an hour here. But Britt asks, what, what do you suggest is the best way to bring people of different fishing styles, kayak, beach, fly, et cetera, together for a stronger presence? And how do we reach more people to rally around this issue? Well, Britt, I'm going to tell you from being an employee of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and how we do things is um, – bring people together whether it's over a beer but uh bringing bringing people together that have a common interest and it's for the common good if you can get them together and talk um it it makes a big difference for example is i'm doing a lot of work right now on uh congressman simpson's plan to breach the four lower snake river dams and it's amazing um, the amount of people that if you're able to have a civil conversation with them and present them with the facts that people are actually able, uh, willing to listen. Um, they may not agree with it, but they are willing to listen and it's worked really well. But groups like Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, American Saltwater Guides Association, um, and there's plenty of others, um, organizations out there, is talk to them, ask them questions. And if they have some kind of get together or event, go and talk to other people and you'd be surprised at how many of those different style anglers that you would meet. Um, another one is support businesses like Abby's at Kismet Outfitters or Peter's at the Saltwater Edge or the guides that are out there. And, you know, if you're gonna book a trip with a guide, ask them, ask them what they, what they do. Um, what they're working on uh, see if their website talks about conservation because it's huge. The, it, it, 
we may not want to think about it this way, but everybody is making money off of a resource, so they should be giving back. I know that 20 years ago, I would go out with guides all the time. I ran a fly shop in Connecticut, and the guides I would go with, I didn't want to keep a fish maybe every once in a while, but if that fish was in the slot limit or over the size, they'd ask, do you want it? And if I said no, they were killing it anyways. Those, those fish were dying no matter if I took it home or somebody else did. So, you know, look at, look at business conservation efforts and what they do to further the cause. It's, it's important and it's money that's coming out of their pocket to give more opportunity to other people. So, um, I want to thank you all for doing this because I know that you're taking time out. Um, it's nine o'clock there on the East coast. And you know, you guys do this with your business and you have other jobs and you have other things to do, but you want to make sure that you have striped bass and other saltwater species, not only for yourself, but for other people. So thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to inform our members about what's going on. My pleasure. Thank you. Anyone has questions, you, please reach out, please. Sure. Sure. Here. You had a question? No, if anyone does, email me or call me. Oh, okay. I'm happy to answer Great. as always. Excellent. Thank you. And like I said, everyone will be getting an email in the next couple of days as far as uh, they'll have a recording of this broadcast and all the information you'll need to make a comment and hopefully win something from Peter. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a good night. Good to see everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.